This is Laura, aka The Sounds Familiar, talking with Good Company. Um, before we start, do you guys mind introducing yourselves? Uh, yeah, I'll start. I'm John Lane, vocals, and uh, I like to eat food. <laughs> uh, hi, Ralph Rill, keyboard player, vocals, and I like to party. Yes. I mean, that's important. Uh, I'm Rich, uh, aka Unknown. I play MPC, and when we're not the band, I DJ for Odyssey. Uh, I'm Dennis. I'm the bass player slash musical director slash party all the timer. Party all the time. So I guess the, the overarching theme is partying. We love the party. Kinda. You want to be And then Olivier, don't don't feel left out. No, I'm not. I don't feel left out. I'm good. Okay. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Um. I'm, I'm not. I'm not quite departed with that. As you, as you can see, I've got my tea with me. Tea. Um, Olivier, Olivier St. Louis, uh, guitarist and vocalist in the band. Nice. All right. So um, you can all answer the questions. You can, some of you can answer them. One of you can answer them. It's all up to you. I don't. It doesn't bother me. Um, so <clears throat> the first question I always ask in interviews is, "What's your earliest memory of hip hop?" Oh man. Uh, I'm gonna let Rich start because he's the hip hop connoisseur. Oh gosh, oh man, uh, I, I I can't quite call. I, I guess uh, you know I'm the youngest in my family, and uh, I have I have two older sisters, and um, my oldest sister is seven years older than me, and I just remember as a little kid uh, wondering what a Walkman was because she would never take hers off her ears, and I could always hear the faint rumblings of hip hop in the back seat of the car coming from my sister's Walkman she never took off and I would say if I had to pinpoint my earliest it was uh it was second hand treble from 80s hip hop <laughs> coming out of my sister's walkman while I was in a car seat you know what I mean? so, so not low pop but not low <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I bought him that was it uh, I'll go next because mine is quick uh I was going to a church I probably was like 14 or 15 I was going to a church, and right next to the church, it was at a, it was in a storefront, like mall, like strip mall. It was a record store right next door to us. So I would go to, go to the church, and I would go next door, and I bought Common Sense, like I bought a Common Sense cassette tape, and I was like my first. I put that thing in, and I was like, mm. <laughs> that was mine. You just <laughs> randomly picked it up. You're like, this looks good. Yeah, it was, I, mean, I heard the name, but like I didn't know, I didn't know the record, so it was like. Uh, I just I just bought it. It cost me like it was a cassette tape in like ninety five, so it was like seventy five dollars. <laughs> 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 and I bought it, and then I was like, you know, I, I had a cassette player at home. I put it in, and that was it for me. I think uh, for me it was my mom. I'm the oldest of the group. I'm seventy six. And, uh, <laughs> so you look my fantastic. Mom, my, my mom used to uh, get her hair done every other Saturday, and I would have to go with her. So I would bring my Walkman, and uh, I didn't have any cassette tape with any hip hop. So I would put it on the radio, and there was a uh, a radio station that would play hip hop at lunchtime. And the first joint that I heard, I think, was uh, LL Cool J's "I'm Bad," and that literally changed my ears because up until then my mom became like this born again Christian so she threw away all her, her soul record mm -hmm. all that stuff. So all I grew up listening to was Glenn Campbell, Kenny Rogers, Steve Miller and all that stuff. And then you know hearing rap really changed my life at that point. Mm -hmm. And same kind of like John. My mom became a born again spiritual Christian. But we were sneaking hip hop tapes like it was crack or something. So we like meet each other. <laughs> we were literally like meet each other like on the corner. We're like, yo. So I got that new child called Glass. And I was like, yo, let me get back. And I like burned it. I also got some crack. <laughs> you got sweet in the deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, so anyway, like, so with my mom, she would like find all these like un Christian. Yeah, you know, like ungodly rap thing, and she would replace it with a Christian hip hop. 
like cassette or CD. And I was like, what is going on here? You know? And I was like, yeah, yeah, it was so weird. <laughs> because I was listening to, I, I was like sneaking to listen to secular hip hop, but I was like learning everything about Christian rap. And it, was just, it was just a weird, <laughs> yeah. It was a weird upbringing by hip hop. Yeah, I don't think I've ever heard the word unchristian before. I know. That's that's how they do it, I guess. That's, that's true. That's how they do it. That's their team talk. Collins? Yeah. Um, my earliest memory of hip hop was LL Cool J's I Need Love. That was my first that was my first taste of hip hop. I was at my cousin's house. I think I must have been like what, like nine? And we used to be used to hang out at each other's place you know, in the basement, like on Fridays. And y'all you, you, remember Friday Night Videos? Oh, yeah, 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 of course. Yep. So that's when that popped in, that was my, my, that was my first experience. Nice. Um, what were some of your favorite records when you were younger, hip hop or otherwise? Wow. Uh, actually, this is a good, we bonded on tour over this one, John. We bonded over a tour, this is way non-hip hop. But a uh, 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 love of uh, Michael Frank's passion fruit. Oh yeah. There's uh, my my parents were always like always had music on, but nobody. I'm the black sheep of the family, only musician. But they always loved playing music. A staple every year, heading down to the beach or whatever, was this this. What would you even say? He's a jazz artist. He is a jazz musician. He's a jazz musician yeah. uh, named Michael Franks, and I guess the repetition of them playing the record. That record still to this day, uh, it's it's such a pastel 80s smooth jazz listening record. Mm -hmm. But when we first got together as a band and we're going on tour <laughs> and we're, you know, we're, we're two to everything people are discovering, what other people like, you know, you, you play something in the background. I was always kind of scared to play it. And then John was like, no, that's my jam. Yeah. That's my jam. And now we bond over Tokyo and all that stuff. Your you know? mom called. <laughs> 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 you know, it's funny. I would say Miles would be Thriller. Um, I grew up listening to my, like the Jacksons. I was my, my cousin was my older cousin listening to Jacksons all the time. So I would I listen to all the Jackson stuff, all the Prince stuff. Um, my dad loved P Funk, so you know just mm. stuff. Mm. Just like mm -hmm. you, call <laughs> you can't make noise when I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> you said P Funk. I can't help it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, all that stuff, uh, Brothers Johnson. Uh, as I got older, I, when I started getting into jazz, I, I had a Miles Davis. The Count of Blue was like on rotation for like seven years, and and then I got into the Yellow Jackets. So it was like, and then Jack Opus started supposed to, you know. I'm kind of I'm kind of similar with, uh, with Dennis. Like it, it's uh, it just spans so many genres. Yeah. You know, I was I was raised on like country music, easy listening music, and then hip hop, but then I started getting into like Brazilian, Brazilian nice. not even Bossa Nova, I'm talking like like the straight up Brazilian full hole type mm -hmm. stuff. And then uh, of course, when I got into college, I was heavily influenced by jazz music, uh, Coltrane, Miles Davis's uh, Birth of the Cool, mm -hmm. and all that. So, so I think there's a, a record by a group called Bernier and Cartier, which is a Brazilian group that I played for these cats. And that's that's generally a staple when we're on tour as well. Yeah, man, I I, would, I, I definitely would say, um, definitely raised up on the gospel and things like that. But then when it, when I crossed over, <laughs> it was um, <laughs> <laughs> it was Tribe Called Quest, man. I loved the Tribe, and then You're I started. Number one for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Then I started liking like anybody off the branch of Tribe. That was definitely, that was definitely a heat seat for me. Neo Soul. But, um, but yeah, but then I really just, really got on a Neo Soul kick. I would say like my very first, the sixth grade. So it was like literally sixth grade year, middle school. And I listened to Omar and I was like, oh my God, oh, yeah. that's so no, dope. I like, that him up. Yeah. I, like I knew I loved Soul to Soul and we got to play with Omar and I was just looked down. I was like, oh my gosh, like, um, that was awesome, and then then I then it was you know D'Angelo for me. It was definitely mm -hmm. like wow. It was definitely like a lot of soul songs there, um, because for me that neo soul, um, old school hip hop vibe that collab, that was that was it for me. It was and like that's what 
basically brought us all together. Yeah, yeah, that was it. Mm -hmm. And then I started learning so many other artists from you guys. <laughs> So it just went on. Your question, your question was influences or like. No, like what were sorry, it's been a while. Um, what were your favorite records growing up? It could still okay. be. One. It was a record. Okay, okay, because I had I had a mix just with the guys. A lot of our stories are very similar, mm -hmm. um, in terms of what we you know we grew up kind of listening to. Um, my favorite records growing up were, um, y'all remember um. The Doobie Brothers, there is a light. Da, da, oh, da, yeah. da, 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 da. When like that was that was one of those records that I was I was hooked I was hooked on for a while. Um, so yes, yeah, so it was it was that it was that and it was that and Knee Deep, Problem of Funkadelic Knee Deep. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Them two, for some reason, so far apart, but for me, like I was just hooked on that that and then. Um, and then Michael Jackson's thrill, I would say, growing up was like a, a really big thing for me. And then as I transitioned, as I transitioned on and got older, of course, as Ralph was saying, the D'Angelo's, um, Bilal. Uh, the whole Soul Aquarians. Yeah, yeah Soul Aquarians, to, Soul Aquarians to an extent. Um, but like D'Angelo, Bilal, Maxwell. I mean, I, I was I was listening to I was listening to a lot of like, like what was like. Um, I guess it was like mainstream R and B at the time. Yeah. So it was at first it was like you know Chico DeBarge, Joe, um, and then Maxwell kind of changed things a little sure. bit with this whole kind of seventies throw in, mm -hmm. and then everything really changed for me when I discovered D'Angelo. Like after I discovered D'Angelo, like yeah. my my ears completely flipped. You know, then it was the Roots, and it was like researching and going backwards to Marvin Gaye and Al Green, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. So yeah. Yeah. I can't yeah. Do a new edition. I used to think I was Ralph Transman. I thought I was Ralph Transman. <laughs> yeah, I was. I remember this before. Oh, bro. Yeah, yeah. Wait, my Ralph Transman. He was the lead singer. I wasn't about it. Dude, he was, he was like, he was like the '80s. He was like the '80s boy band version. I'm like, that's you can see. He was. He was. He was. It was the original. He was the guy. He was. Sensitivity, man. I was out. That wasn't. Yeah. Sensitivity. Yeah. 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 Blowing in the wind. I used to love them. Yes. Um, <laughs> I mean, I left out Stevie Wonder. Stevie Wonder is, yeah, yeah, was my top. Yeah, but, sure. you know, that I, I tried to eat. It's almost like a staple. You kind of grow up with that. That's like like your yeah, parents. Yeah, man. It's a given. For, for us and how we grew up, that's like, that's like, that's a given. That's, especially for us growing up, that's a given. Stevie had to be in there. Yeah, yeah, when I saw him live, I was just like, is this real life? <laughs> yeah. We played with him. We played with him. So it was... Oh, you did? Yeah, a couple times. Nice. And you guys love Parliament. Uh, George Clinton was one of the coolest interviews I've ever done in my life. <laughs> I play, I'm we, uh, we open up for him. We open up for him. We did four shows in San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah. Four shows. Who haven't you played with? Um, each other. <laughs> yeah, we don't know each other. <laughs> so this is the first time you've ever met? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just picked him up off the street. They yeah. just knocked on my door and I let him in. You look nice. <laughs> I saw they had a babysit them. <laughs> that was really nice of you to take them in. So, um, it's a big space. <laughs> um, so I have written down what ignited your passion for music, but I think it'd be more apt to ask when did you kind of decide that music was what you wanted to do for a living as opposed to just something that you did maybe as a hobby to begin with or and you find like this is what I want to do with my life. Oh man, that was for me, I would have to say um, sixth grade, I started playing the flute. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> when I started playing the flute. You guys are, you guys in middle school? <laughs> the only reason I played flute was because none of the other instruments were available. And so I was like, whatever. So I, I played the flute for a couple of years and then I tried to play the drums. And then the teacher in my middle school said, we have too many drummers. So I played another. Um, uh, instrument that did not attract girls, which was the baritone. <laughs> and then finally, my high school teacher let me play drums. And that's when I really, really started taking it seriously. With my freshman year. Mm -hmm. I think I got a, well, not a similar story, but I was like 15. And I remember I had, a, I was playing seven or eight instruments at that point, And I, I got mm -hmm. into bass. And um, my, my musical director at the school I was at, 
he sat me down. I was doing sports too. I was I was playing football, basketball, tennis. And he was he sat me down and he was like, look, if you take it seriously, you can do music for the rest of your life. You know, if you if you go into sports, yeah. you might get like three or four years out of it before you start to get injured. Like seriously, but you know, and he played football in he played football in high school and college. And he was like, you know, if you take music seriously, you can that's a real talk. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I buckled down and I wanted to be a bass player after that. So I was like, I'm just going to focus my energy on that, you know. Nice. Uh, I used to take drums from a, um, a man named Clyde Baytown Lucas. He was a drummer. And he used to, I, I, I used my drum teacher growing up for 18 years. He was amazing. He toured the world playing mostly jazz. Um, Played the inauguration ball, but I when I came down to his basement, he had a wall of um, just posters everywhere he went, and I and and he would just keep adding on to it. And I remember like it started out about you know just a couple posters, and then I go down there and it was a couple more, and then it was a couple more, and then his whole wall was filled with all these places all over the world. And I was like, how did you do that? And he was like, yo, you just got to keep playing the drums. Keep paying your dues. And I was like, well, I don't know. Whatever gets me there, I definitely want to get there. He was like, pay your dues. Keep listening to music. Keep playing to music. And keep practicing. You're going to get there. And then eventually, it was just like, OK, I'm going to play and meet and greet with anybody that can that does music. Try to get on things. Try to communicate. Try to work something so that's what really started for me it was like 10 11 years old like seeing my drum teacher's wall on his in his basement that's the, the thing about the thing about ralph is i don't think a lot of people know that he started as a drummer yeah Boy, like, he you also started going into grown men's basements man what's up <laughs> <laughs> that could have ended that could have ended that that could have ended really bad that could have that, that could have <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know if anybody mirrors this sentiment, but um, without going even into the story of what led up to it, I just know the first time that I created a piece of music that was my own, however rudimentary that was, and sampling something and making, you know, a hip hop beat or whatever. The day one, I can't even tell you what the beat was. But I remember that feeling because there's a little, little tidbit of that feeling in whatever I made yesterday. You know, as soon as I did that, I was like, oh, this is it. Like, this is it no matter what happens. I don't care if I become, you know, later in life, if I'm a doctor or a lawyer, this is still going to be it. Like, it, it, didn't, it didn't matter to me once I did it whether or not it turned into anything or not. It was just like a, 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 a fish in water. I just knew nice. that. That was that was what I wanted to do. You know. Can I just say for the record, we look like terrorists. <laughs> <laughs> That's why your opening statement no, no, made no, sense. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you guys look responsible. That's what you look like. <laughs> responsible, responsible terrorists. Yeah. Responsible terrorists. Sure. <laughs> we want the money, but we're gonna wear our masks. <laughs> Um, I think my, I think I, I finally decided that I wanted to do music, uh, after, after working as a sign, I was working as a chromatography scientist when I got out of university, I did my degree in molecular biology and I was working as a scientist for, I'd say about six months and I bought my first MPC. And I was working on music at night. And that, this was like, this is kind of showing my age. I was, I was, this is during the MySpace era where you could actually make music, you could upload it onto the internet. I remember that. And um, the, the, the amount of attention I was getting from that and then meeting, you know, guys in the, in the, in the, in the DC area, the, the, the DMV area, um, started to confirm to me that maybe there's something that I could do. And then finally, uh, a label, uh, from Holland, uh, Rotterdam, in, um, in fact, uh, came calling and said, hey, listen, we're interested in releasing your music. We want to release your, your your song on MySpace as, as like a single. I said, okay, cool. You know, and then as we got to kind of exchange more, it's like, hey, listen, you know, 
do you have a lot of music? Are you, what else are you working on? And I told him that I had an album in the works and he's like, listen, you know, we should, we should talk more. And for some reason that just said to me, okay, Olivia, it's time to make it, it's time to make a switch. And I, I handed, I handed my notice and I was working. Yeah. I was working for the American Red Cross at the time as a chromatography scientist. And I handed my, I handed my notice in. And after that, I just quit. And it was, it was all about music. And then I flew to, I flew to Holland and it was, it was on from there. So yeah, that's, that's my, that's my first step. Olivia, we don't appreciate you dumbing down our intelligence. <laughs> 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 you know, like, yeah, we listen to music on our walk, man. Yeah, I went to my house a lot. I was a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> well, you but know, it's I'm like, that space shuttle. I'm gonna just come down the <laughs> and, uh, I just, <laughs> I did it. I'm trying to cure cancer, and I said, no, I'm going to do music. Well, I'm trying to cure myself. I suddenly decided. And... Uh, OK, Bruce Banner. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you guys remember having any mentors once you got going with music? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I had I had two. I had two my band directors from high school. I call them my musical pops because they literally took me under their wing. Like I, I showed an interest in music and they just kinda was like they took me to clubs when I was like a teenager. They would like sit me in a corner, I would watch them play. And um one of them named Mr. Uh, Kenneth Dickerson and the other one is Yusef Chisholm. Uh, uh, Kenneth Yusef. Dickerson was a drummer, uh Yusef was a bass player. And when I got to high school, I didn't know what I was gonna do because I went to a, another high school um further from my older sister. And when I got there, Yusef was there. When I walked into the band room, he was just sitting there. And I was like, oh, he was like, cool. And then he just kind of like laid the pathway for me for how to become a professional. Like, and I just watched him. He was, a, I mean, he's, he's still digging now around right? here. Like, he's, he's a killer. So it was like, I got to watch it from a, from a standpoint that most people don't get to see at that age. And then they, they, would, they would tell me little tidbits and stuff that I would have to do to become a professional, you know. And, I, you know, without that, without that mentorship, I don't know, you know, it's, Without, without that, without that, who knows, you know? So. I mean, I, I didn't really, hence the name Unknown. I kind of like lived in an area. You know, I never really, I kind of took that moniker when I was young. And uh, it was literally because uh, no one knew what I was doing. A lot of people have like that, that, that old uh, story of like the beating on the lunchroom table with their friends and rapping. I, I was just the one guy. If anybody wanted to know about rap music, they were like, oh, I think Rich does that. And I was just the one guy for so long, and it was no formal training. At the time, it was very frustrating. But uh, once I got older and got into professional situations, I realized I needed education. And I went to school for audio engineering and things like that to, to, you know, to beef my skill up and get on the right track. But then later in life, I found it was a blessing because I, I didn't necessarily um, – come up under a tutelage where I was taught like somebody else's invisible rules or taught like these kind of things. So a lot of times I'll come to a point in music or a conclusion in music where a lot of people around me are like, uh, how'd you do that? Or what, what'd you do? Or what happened? Because it was a little non-traditional because uh, for the first, you know, eight, nine years of my musical career as a kid, uh, I couldn't bounce anything off anyone. I was just literally feeling my way through the dark, you know? I, you know what? And the coolest thing about Richard is like when we on tour and people are like, oh, what do you do? Richard replies, everything that you don't see on stage is me. <laughs> <laughs> Every instrument you don't see on stage. No one ever knows what I'm doing. <laughs> like, I saw you back there with a machine. Like, I'm playing all the instruments you don't see on stage. <laughs> I think we all have uh, mentors, um, you know, growing up, but. When we become a band, we are each other's mentors as well. Yeah. And we all buy them. Mm -hmm. We all have a yeah, lot of uh, You know, whenever we're, whenever we're backing up Olivier or the Odyssey or whenever Good Company just has a gig together, like you can see just how we vibe off of each other and how we influence yeah. each other. So we're all each other's mentors. Yeah, man. I I got to say the same thing, man. I, I mentioned my one mentor was uh, Clyde Bates on Lucas, but I mean, amongst that, for people that really love to teach me music, it's definitely this crew of gentlemen. Like, when I met, I met uh, Odyssey through Rich. Mm -hmm. And when I met Rich, I was making like 
Teddy Riley beats like off of corn trading. Like, I, was, I was like making some dance party beats, and Rich was like, yeah. Rich was making these. Yeah. And Rich was making these crazy like underground boot bastard beats where the baseline never meant to meet. But it was just crazy, and I was like, why don't we just come together? And then they just branched me out in a world of music, man. And then it was like, I met Rich, and then I met Amir from that, and then I met, you know, the rest of the company, and it was over. I, I, over. I think I think it's a great thing, even to this day, in the, when we're touring around, and we're in a tour band, where everybody, in a very friendly way, everybody's like, so have you heard this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's on your mind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my like, yeah, I, I see you, and how about this? Yeah. <laughs> And, and at the end of the day, you're just like, oh my god, I haven't. I got out of that a long time ago. Music, you know? It reminds me of a story of when uh, we were we were driving somewhere in the United States. I was actually driving the tour tour van, and most of everybody was asleep. And I just started playing something random on my phone, and I knew that I was playing something dope because I felt this hand on my shoulder. <laughs> Just, it, it was all it was, was his head just went. Creepy. Heard, Johnny, what is that? <laughs> I, knew, I knew it was Olivier. <laughs> but whenever like, you just start playing random things and it wakes somebody up, you know that you like yeah, you at least introduce that. something new to somebody. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we jam on the tour bus. It's crazy. It's crazy. No, definitely, definitely. I would say, yeah, these guys, these guys are definitely my mentors. Um, just being able, you know, I don't think John's actually mentioned it, but, you know, I know Dennis and John both have qualifications in music. I know that John has a master's in jazz. I think you've, I think you've also got a master's as well, Dennis. Not a master's, but I got a degree. <laughs> okay. <yeah. laughs> don't try to shortchange me. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> but, you know, like, just, so, you know, fun, <laughs> But like in you know, uh, in terms of like being able to pick their brains, um, you know, in, in regards to like mu like like music theory, um, it's always great to have those conversations with John and with Dennis, you know, asking them to pick me apart as a musician, and then being able to get the gospel and the church element from Ralph, is always awesome because he's always he's always telling me about coloring, you know, and how to like, you know, color with different like chord inversions and so on and so forth, and then you've got. Rich, you know, John and Rich are very much the same, but you know, Rich, DJ Unknown, he's just a chronicle of music. Like his 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 library of music is so vast. I think I think he's got enough music to play until we're like 80. You know what I mean? Like so Which is in a couple of years for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're 76, that's right. So yeah, you got like four. <laughs> So yeah, so I, I definitely concur with what John is saying that, you know, I guess I guess to some degree all influence each other, but these guys are definitely my mentors. I get to pick I get to pick so much from every individual in terms of what their strengths are. Definitely. And then if I may say, then not only having you know, people like the, these group of gentlemen that, that that we travel, you know, together, but meeting the other musicians and producers oh, yeah. along the way yeah. that you're like oh my gosh who are you and i'm so glad i get to meet you you know what i mean and meeting these other producers that become also you know um that's just the influence that we get when we travel together yeah yeah because we all know different people and inspire mm -hmm. and then we take it back and we we take we take that information back and we regurgitate amongst ourselves you know and we kind of discuss it amongst ourselves and sure. we, yeah, we share it, and in, in, even in certain situations, we might incorporate certain things that we might have picked up along the way. So, it's very organic the way in which in which we work. You know, we have a format, but not every show is the same. If that makes sense. Um, so, I know you're all living in different cities now. Um, were you living in the same city when you met? How did you all meet? Uh, well, it's um, it's kind of a kind of a funny story because um. Uh, Amir and Rich were working on a project together a while ago. I think it was like around 2005, 2006. And when they were doing a music video, they called Ralph to be in the music video. 
when the music video came out, I was watching it <clears throat> with these guys, and I was like, is that me on drums? <laughs> so apparently I was a part of them. I was part of the group as well. And then of course, Dennis and I, we've been playing together for, for a long time. Yeah. And then, you know, Odyssey and Olivia, they've been friends for, for a long time as well. So it was just kind of like different pieces that, that kind of came together. We were friends before we were a group. Yeah, every, everybody knew each other before we ever got together and played you know, in any iteration as, as the group that sits before you. But I think also uh, everybody at some point was uh, playing um, on an Odyssey studio record. Right. Yeah. So it wasn't a far reach or stretch for him. He was just like, oh, the guy that plays bass for me, he's in the group. The guy yeah. that plays drums for me, he's in the group. You know, we just, everybody just, yeah. that was around before this was a thing. Um, so it was very easy. There was no audition or anything. It was just yeah. we all finally got in a room together, and it was it was kind of on from there. So where would you guys say your unique sound stems from? Was it kind of a direction from Odyssey when he brought you all together, or did it kind of come together organically? Or mm -hmm. we should answer that. Well, uh, I think I think it it stems from Odyssey first because he's the producer for the records. And, um, you know, when, we, when we're learning records and we're learning songs to tour, we have to use those as a template. Then we are able to add elements to it, like uh, to make it out, like to make it more organic, to make it more like a good company experience. Um, even, even as like, since I act as musical director, a lot of times I, I build out shows before and then we kind of come together and I kind of teach it how I hear it in my head or how I see it. And then from that, we're able to take it and everybody adds their own pieces to the actual arrangements that we come up with together. So it's, 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 a, it's, like, a, it's like a mixing pot. We all have a, a piece of it in terms of like what we add to it. And then just kind of stir the ship a little bit, you know, like to make sure that the show has the ups and peaks and valleys that a show needs to be a successful show. You know, especially when you're doing the same show. Well, we, we did one, I think one run we did like 170 shows or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So when you're doing the same thing, you have to make it exciting to yourselves to make it exciting to the audience, you know? So you have to, it has to have this this longevity piece in order for it to be a good piece and a good experience for everybody, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. Anyone else wanna add anything? What's that? That's no, right. I, yeah, I, 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 I kind of said mine on before I met. Rich, Rich introduced me to Amir. Uh, I met Rich through a, one of my good friends that I was in high school with. And um, it literally was like, oh my gosh, we should, oh my goodness, you should, oh my goodness, we should just, that's it. Like, where I was playing keys on the records. And, um, and you know, that it's been like that ever since 2001. Yeah, I mean, it bears, it bears mentioning that, um, Amir and Rich were roommates for a while, and they were making beats. And I think around that time, you know, Olivier stepped into the picture, and the three of them, you yeah, know, were working. And we, and we, you know, always even before that, it's one of those things. Where everybody that that's here now, I think, falls under that category of like, uh, you know, uh, the kind of connections you make any time in life. You know, how many times as an individual do you go to a party full of people and you end up meeting? one person and they end up right. being a friend later in life. Yeah. And it's like every situation I can think of with all these guys, that's what it was. It didn't matter yeah. how or who they were affiliated with or this or that. Yeah. There was something about that person and their energy and what they gave off, you know, artists and, and personally that was like, okay, this guy, I gotta see, I gotta see, you know, stick around with this guy. And, and I think uh, everybody just kind of slipped through the cracks like that. And, Right. So, with numerous performances in Asia, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, and the U.S., do you have any memorable stories from the road? I'm almost afraid to ask. Uh, <laughs> how, much time, how much time do you have? How much time do you have? I have all the time. Uh, you know, I wish we had pictures to go along with the story. That yeah. I, have. No. I have some. And you can send me some, and then I can kind of filter them. <laughs> this, this one time, Ralph was sleeping in the tub. <laughs> <laughs> true story. True story. True story. 
There was nowhere else to go. Yeah. <laughs> I was so the one story that I that I do, I, I don't know if I can get the story straight, but do you remember when we had to cross with the Romania? And we the only way we got to join us? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know the I can't remember the, the, the full story behind Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We we were crossing uh Serbia. Serbia, that's what it was. And uh Serbia was, you know, in, in some kind of civil turmoil. And uh we we didn't have, you know, we didn't have a gig or anything in Serbia, but we just had to literally drive across the country for five hours. And what they wouldn't let us do is they wouldn't let us go across the border, drive, <laughs> and then uh, come out the other side like you would think. We had to get this document stamp, but the only way to get the document stamp was to go to the border, pick up one of their officials, and he had to ride with us in the car for so five, hours. five hours. And then when we got to the other side, he had to get the document stamp, and then we had to pay to put him on a bus so he could ride, ride back, back to the other border. To side. <laughs> and, you know, they, basically, they basically gave us two options. They were like, well, he can follow in a car, and you can pay an exorbitant amount of euros, or he can ride with you for nothing, and you have to put him on a bus back. That's the only way you're, you're going to drive so through this weird. country. And there was no going around. Going around was just um, I was going to take all day. It would have taken so much so much longer. So we did it, and it was the weirdest it thing. It was the most awkward. <laughs> you know, he, he's, 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 he wants that job. <laughs> I mean, yeah. he's definitely an unofficial member. You know, he, he's a he's, shout out to Serbia, wherever in Serbia. <laughs> we'll put him on the kazoo or the triangle or something. You know? He's definitely an unofficial, unofficial dude, but it okay. was... Yeah, it was and very strange. Did, did he just sit in the front seat? He, didn't yeah. sit in the front seat. he just he sat, sat in the front seat. seat. Yeah. That's the least you can do, right? Yeah. He just uh, was sitting there and was like, mm. and we were like, so can we have our normal conversation? <laughs> 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 Did you like record yeah. us? Or what it, it, it felt like you were in the car with your parents for a yeah. while. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was very funny. It was like, <laughs> 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 you know, I, got, I got a funny story. This is a funny story. I don't, I don't know who was driving. I think who was driving. We were in Vienna and you broke the window. Oh, <laughs> oh yo, I was just about to say. I was just about to say. It was the entire door. We had a detour. Yeah. We had a sprinter and um, John was trying to park the sprinter. You, I think we were parking it to leave it for the night so we could leave the next morning. And he was trying to gauge the car. Oh, you we were trying to leave. We were trying to leave. Yeah, we and we were all in the car and John was pulling out the sprinter. No, he is. No, before he pulls out, he says, Am I good? And I think everybody was like, yeah, we're good. <laughs> the old window broke. Everybody was like, oh! Yeah, yeah. Oh! Yeah. I was trying to avoid, so there's, there was traffic on the driver's side, and I was trying to avoid not driving in two lanes. So I ended up cutting it too hard, and I hit, there was like this dumpster in front of me. So as I was, as I was pulling the, the van out, I cut it too hard, and I completely sideswiped, or more than sideswiped, the entire side door, yeah. and it was just completely ruined. We got to the venue, they had a, the guy came out with like trash bags and had to tape it up. We had yeah. to drive like two hours to the next to the, yeah, to the, yeah, to the yeah. Mercedes place, and then yeah, we, then we spent like we spent the like whole ten hours, hours, yeah. the entire ten hours. hours waiting for a Mercedes Benz dealer. We were at a Mercedes Benz dealer, and they had to they had to fix. We were there. All good buffet, so. good not buffet. I I actually had <laughs> one one more story. This was our. This was our first tour. We were in Amsterdam, and um, we were at this time. Is it about food? No, it's not. He don't care about that food. So two pounds. We were trying to avoid a lot of music instrument rental talk. So Olivier had this great idea of instead of carrying <laughs> pedals and amps, oh, he had a, this great idea oh, my God. of downloading. Oh. Uh, all of his guitar pedals on an iPad oh, is on an app. It's called an IP. It's called an IPB, IPB pedal board by DigiRack. Yeah. So he had his whole pedal board on his iPad. This was in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. This was in Amsterdam, and we were getting ready to start this song, and Olivier's, you know, tuning all this stuff on his iPad, and he has to start the song. So and the song was called Long Distance. The song was called Long Distance. It was a song Perfect. I released with the producer called On Rock. Go figure. And then all of a sudden, we hear the Skype theme song come on. <laughs> That's and, as the song finishes. and Olivier's wife is calling him, and it's, it's actually going through the entire PA in the house. 
Amazing. And he gets down. <laughs> he gets down on his hands and knees, and he's talking into his iPad. And he goes, oh, no, first person is said, answer. Oh, that's right. That's right. He says, go ahead and answer. So he answers it. And he goes, uh, honey, I'm in the middle of a show right now. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure the crowd loved it. Oh, they loved it. Oh, yeah. 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 It's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> oh, I'll never do that again. I'll, I'll never buy another one again. Don't, don't never say never. <laughs> I'm on analog now. Where's the right now? Where's the right now? I stole that thing, man. I eBay that. I eBay it, man. I eBay. Um. So, what was your initial reaction to being referred to the New Roots some years ago? Referred well, to the New Roots. Um, I think it's important for everyone to know that um, we are all extremely inspired and influenced by the roots uh, because they they come from they come from a genre that we all grew up listening to, and they come from PA. PA, thank you. Well, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, but you know Sorry. they they are one of very very few groups that is an actual live hip hop band. Right. So I think being compared to them is, a, is an honor, but we also like to let people know that you know, we we don't want to be considered the new roots because the roots are the roots, and they're doing their own thing and we're doing our own thing. Exactly. We definitely pick up a lot. Of, you know, we're motivated by what they do, and um, we could never be them, especially at the level that that they are right now. They're like they're they're the heroes. So to be to be compared to them is an honor, um, but we all we always like to say, you know, we don't want to be, we don't want to be known as the new roots. We, we're a good right. company. We're you know, something else. Our sound is completely different from theirs, but you know, we're completely inspired and honored to be called that. Yeah, and I, and I think really it speaks to, uh, unfortunately, a, a an overall, not a, not an overall arcing uh, shortage of hip hop bands, maybe you could say that, uh, as far as hip hop in general, but mm -hmm. I think, uh, of hip hop bands that have had some form of success and that all the members are African American, um, that uh, that is a very, you know, you start to really, rare. <laughs> really slim down the category. And I think sometimes we get that, I mean, not based on anything but the association that no one can name five of those, you right. know what I mean? Right. Um, uh, so so uh, again, it, it's an honor, but I think sometimes people just say it by default yeah. because they're trying to I agree. Yeah, I think people like to compare, it helps them. That's how they yeah. see right. it. It's like the LeBron, Michael Jordan comparing, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. No, I'm not even gonna go into that. instrumentation on Odyssey's latest EP release, Odd Cure. Was it all recorded before the pandemic? If not, what resources did you use to ensure that it came together properly? Hmm. Well, I can start. I, guess. I don't I don't know when, what, what songs were picked to, for the record when he recorded mm -hmm. them. But I know we've been recording since we were on tour last, which would be 2018. So we've been recording with Odyssey since even before that, like we've been working on, even on Toby recording songs, we set right. up in the studio in a, in a hotel room and record tune. So he has a library of tunes that he can just pick from. You, know? so you never know, like, you know, I get, I mean, even when I'm at home, like I have here in the studio space in my house right now, and I'll get like six or seven songs just sent to me and I'll just play on them and send them back. So, you know, just. I think that's how we all kind of work. We just, yeah, yeah. even with each other, we just kind of pass these, we, we, I'm working on this idea, yeah. I'll send it out, and then people play on it, and then we'll send it back. So it's like, it's always revolving. So, yeah. you know. From what I understand, there's a song on, on the EP that's from like 2014. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's kind of like when you, when you can work with a person, you work with them, yeah. um, especially off times on tour, you'll find a couple people huddled in a hotel room playing on each other's stuff. Yeah. Some stuff sees the light of day, and some stuff never does for, no other reason than it just, you know, wasn't the one that got picked. But mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to pinpoint because there's no, there's not quite a, uh, hey guys, we're doing this and here's the plan and whatever. It just kind of 
one day you're like, oh, we're dropping the record. <laughs> yeah, let's uh, let's yeah. get on a bus and a plane. <laughs> you know what I mean? It just, just kind of comes together. I think with technology, it definitely helps because you know, within the past, you know, eight eight months, Olivier and Odyssey have just sent files to all of us and just say, oh, I need this, oh, I need this, and then we just send it yeah. to them, and then whenever they're ready to put it out, they put it out. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm the one main dude that definitely works hand in hand with Odyssey. So he'll call me uh, to go to where he is most of the time. So I do get to see a lot of the blueprint early. But even with that, it's still the same. It's still it's still <laughs> the same way where it's like, man, what happened to this? Uh, yeah. I switched this whole. Uh, yeah, it's like light years. And, it, and and I'll be like, but I was there for everything. I heard everything. I was right there. And, and, it, and it's still like, you know, you never know. It's always it's always a mystery. Then you hear the album, you're like, oh my gosh, like, like this is where you're at now. But I, I it, yeah, it's all a blessing. Um. So I've heard that you're currently recording your debut album release. Uh, if you've been working together since the early 2000s, what's taken so long? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, 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 I just got a set of drums. No, no, no. No, no we, um, it's, 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 just been, it's just been an issue of, um, I actually see Maureen McFadden on right now. I, I just excuse myself. I got to go take, take my bases to my base there. Go for it. I see Maureen McFadden on. She's a, she, she, she's a, PR, she runs a PR company in uh, Philadelphia, and she's been hounding us for like the last two, three years about putting something together, and we've just been dragging our feet. And I think it mostly stems from trying to find a sound um, so that we don't sound like Snarky Puppy or we don't sound like Robert <laughs> Drum Kids or Anderson Pop. And we want to create an original sound, and it's really difficult to do when we're not all in the same space, even though we're on tour together. Right. The time when we're on tour and then when we're home, we're at home, we're like trying to relax and we're trying to chill. Yeah. I think so I'm, it's like we we all have our own individual pro projects. Like, you know, Ralph's got like six albums out. He's got a ton of beats. I got beats. Olivier's got a, a, a lot of songs, a lot of records out. John has like 10 albums. Well, but like, if, if, if we were to like put our heads together and just put our, you know, put music together, that would be easy. But we don't feel like that's gonna do us justice. So as a result, I think what's been taking so long is is just trying to find out what we want to do sonically. And you know, with the help of Amir, he's he's definitely trying to uh, help us find that sound. Yeah. So one, you know, it's it's slowly coming together, but it's just been taking a long time just just for that reason. And I, I mean, yeah, you can't rush it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have uh, we have joints that we already have written. Um, yeah, we've done jam sessions in Europe and we created stuff. Yeah, together. yeah. So we, we yeah. definitely have songs that just definitely need to be recorded. But yeah. but I think what John said, just to backpack off of that, is really to find that creative um, fulfillment with all of us to be like, you know, this record is dope. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I, and I really do think it's like, a, you know, in the one iteration of being the backing band for Odyssey Music, there's a blueprint kind of laid out. And it's like, hey, this is what I did. This is how you were a part. Uh, this is what we're doing together. And we may flare off and put our own influences in it. And, Dennis here might, you know, change up the program and it may come together into this thing that's much different than the album, but good for the live show. But when we're all here without that influence, you know, every one of these these people, you know, on this call right now is kind of like a, a chief in their own right. If any one of us was given an hour on a stage, we can make it as interesting <laughs> yeah. with our solo material yep. as it would be if we were all together. Not not one single person here is just like, I just play my instrument and I'm an instrument for hire and I really don't do anything else except that. And I think when we get together, there's a, a, a friendly clash of how it should come out because everyone's own voice is so strong right. that it's like you're, you're putting you know five magnets that have different polarities 
together in a room. I think we, we all kind of come together when one person says, hey, replay this thing I did. Yeah. Then it's easy to be like, I'll take this part, I'll take it and go in. But when it really comes down to, to being like, let's pluck something out of the air that we all have a hand in, it, it, it gets complicated because everyone, you know, is slightly different. And just, I think it just makes the wheels spin slower. You know, um, than if we were just a, a, a hired gun or a, you know a hired uh, uh, musician that didn't really couldn't do anything. What, what was the question? Sorry. Uh, why does so long for the oh, oh. You, you said know, you said it was me. No, <laughs> you know it's funny too. I thought we were talking about the show aspect. I say no a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I say no a lot. Like I, if we if we're talking about especially from a live show standpoint. I think Ralph is a testament of how much I can say no. <laughs> like, I say no a lot. Like, you, a whole lot. You, know a whole you, lot. you know what you want. You know what you want. That's okay. Just like, I, I, I can just, I can just, I, we, we did one tour, I think, the 2018 tour, when we started that tour. We, we had, like, two weeks of just, like, running the show before it, it got to, like, a fluidity thing. Mm-hmm. And every day, I would go back and listen to the tapes and be like, yeah, nah. And then when we, have, we had the next sound check, I'd be like, so uh, don't do that again. <laughs> yeah. so it was a lot of that, but I mean, you know, it's interesting. Like, in terms of like a record, it takes a lot of. I think it takes a lot to to build out a record. And like R- Richard said, when you got all these personalities and everybody want to kind of have their hand in it, you have to kind of have somebody kind of steer that shit too. So. Yeah. 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 No, definitely. Definitely. I would. I would. I would add in. I think it was kind of said amongst everybody, but I would add in. I think what's what's really been a contributing factor to us taking so long is just the fact that we've been touring like ridiculously throughout the past, you know, four or five years, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, two years, two years per project release, two years per record. And to, by the time, by the time we've gotten home and recuperated in our, in our perspective, respective corners, already booking agents are back at us like, okay, guys, you need to go out. You've got another, you know, 12, 13, 20 city tour. Oh, you know, um, Odyssey's just been picked up. Odyssey and Good Company. Well, Odyssey's just been picked up, you know, um, uh, by a new booking agent. And now we want to actually, you know, push you to these new territories. And mm-hmm. so just to be able to find time in between touring has been difficult. And then obviously when we finally had a chance to rest, then COVID-19 kicked in. And that right. that kind of that kind of threw us, you yeah, know, yeah, through our, our, mm-hmm. like, Yeah, you know what I mean? So... So it, it, it's coming. I think now that now that we've managed to kind of figure out a new formula in terms of getting together on Zoom, you know, to a degree, you know, things have kind of lifted post, you know, the pandemic and, you know, quarantine regulation. So I'm sure something's coming soon. Are there, any, sorry. <laughs> um, are there any details you can share with us? About what? About the record? The album. About the record. That's about to go. That's about to go. No. <laughs> oh, right. Sorry. Yeah. You told me. You told me you say no a lot. That's first off. What record? Yeah. Right. <laughs> no, we don't. We actually don't really have a lot to share. Um, That's okay. Other than the fact that we're we're working on it. Yeah. It's gonna be a surprise. It's gonna be a surprise. I mean, yeah. Surprise. There's a nice little dropbox folder. I can tell you one thing. I can tell you one thing. The album cover we're all going to have on all white. <laughs> um, wait, the <laughs> album cover what? We're, we're all going to be wearing all white. All white. Oh. All white pants. <laughs> Looking like Teddy Riley. That's it. Pants. We've got, who, who's, who's holding the cane? Who's holding the cane? <laughs> I'm the oldest. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Uh, are there any solo projects you guys want to talk about? Uh, yeah, Odyssey, Odyssey just dropped the record, and Olivier about to drop a record, right? Those are solo projects. Yep. Yeah. I yeah. Dropped, uh, oh, wait. Oh, yeah. 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 I just dropped uh, another instrumental album called Assorted. Um, it's a new instrumental. It's my fourth instrumental uh, project, and I got another project called Studio 77 and that is going to be dropping the end of August. So I'm busy. Thanks. Um yeah I have I have a record coming out. Um it's uh 
It's a four-part little instrumental series. It's meant to be like these short audio stories. And uh, it's called uh, Ninja from Outer Space Cooking with Dinosaurs. <laughs> and, uh, it's, uh, it's, okay. it's a little, little, little abstract. <laughs> you know, what the heck? You know? Play on the field of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, if you will, you know what I mean? It's just a funny little thing. That's so um, so, so <laughs> that. And, and I have a weekly IG live show uh, where I'm DJing and uh, nice. faking, breaking the music, you know, that kind of thing. I, I think the answer to your question about why good company hasn't had a record come out is because everybody's working on their own song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's dingy. It's dingy. Yeah. 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 You can say that, yeah. yeah. I put out an album last year, um, about this time last year, and I have a um, drum project where I'm just playing over uh, J4 beats. It's on SoundCloud. Um, but uh, up until that point, I just decided to start working on my actual drum LP, which is like almost 20 years in the making because I just could not think of what to play. So um, I'm working on something like that, and then, of course, the good company that. John's drum LP is called piano. By the way. Yeah, I'm just playing piano, which is a percussionist. <laughs> that is a percussionist. <laughs> Listen to my piano. Olivier. <laughs> yes. Um, so I have an I have a I have an EP coming out. Uh, there we go. Call that. <laughs> What, 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 what? I said, no, you don't. <laughs> Stop lying. Stop lying. Stop lying. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, I have, I have a single, I have a single, as a matter of fact, coming out um, August 5th. And uh, later, later in the month, um, my EP comes out, Matters of the Heartless, on First Word Records. It's a, uh, it's a label based out of the UK. Um, so yeah, so just working on that really. And then after that's all released, uh, the album will be coming out early next year. So that's, that's, that's the plan as it stands. Um, so outside of your solo projects and the group project, um, what have you guys been focusing on to stay creative during the pandemic? <laughs> <laughs> well, we just just we just recently just recently for the for um for the last single off of off of uh my forthcoming EP, um, Confliction featuring Odyssey, uh, we managed to get together and do like a a, a Zoom live uh a performance. Um, I mean to be honest with you, because we spent so much time around one another, it it managed to happen really quickly considering the the the, the high level of quality. Uh, that came out as a result. Um, Did you guys post I think, that? I want to say I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's posted. Mm -hmm. It's out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, to be honest with you, it, it didn't require a huge amount of <laughs> it didn't require a huge amount of work. I think I, I hit the guys at the, at the beginning of the week. I was like, look, Dennis, can you drop some bass on this? Film yourself close up. Film yourself far off. John, can you do the same? Rich, can you do the same? Ralph, can you do the same? And everybody popped back with their pieces, you know, recorded into 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 their DAWs, respective DAWs, with audio in in like two days. And then the uh, uh, the 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 editor in the arts department at First World Records put the video together. So I think that's one of the things that we actually worked on together collectively, as um, as a band and as good company, including you know including Odyssey because he's featured on the record, and that came out pretty good. Other than that, I mean, I. I've just been taking advantage of watching a lot of the Instagram lives. Um, watching a lot of what, sorry? Instagram live performances. Man. Um, you know, watching DJ Unknown's Instagram live and some of the other DJs um, doing their stuff. The, the verses um, are pretty entertaining. Um, and you know, just other than that, just enjoying time with my son, trying to stay mm -hmm. safe. Trying to live life safely. I've actually been doing shows weekly since March. We've been a quarantine show with a, a harmonica player named Frederick Johnny. So we've been doing weekly shows on Sundays where we go into a house, everybody's sectioned off, the whole band sectioned yeah. off. They live stream it, and we've been doing stuff on DJ D Nice's page. Um, 
I think next week I'm going to Ohio to do some stuff with Dave Chappelle. So we'll be doing the Dave Chappelle live stream. That's so funny. You can't see it, but look at my shirt. <laughs> oh, yeah. There you, oh, go. yeah. there you go. Yeah. I was supposed to be there last week, but Dave went to go see Kanye, so I had to show that. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But I mean, you know, that's that's what we're doing. We're doing these quarantine shows. No, say something funny, Dave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just got my golf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Say something funny, Dave. Say something funny. I mean, I I can't mess with it for the whole day here, but I mean, my uh, one of the blessings, um, unfortunately, in this time of this pandemic, has been um, the fact that I think. You know, with touring and with just general life, it was already so hard to catch up to finishing a lot of projects. Sure. But in the time, in the months that you forcibly had to come home, I mean, it's the most things, whether or not I've actually put them out to the public or, you know, they've got to, you know, there's a timeline for that as well. But the amount of things that I've gotten done, I just, I've never gotten this much creativity. Maybe. It's actually finished and accomplished. Um, in such a short amount of time because I'm just at home all day. You know? <laughs> I got nowhere to go. <laughs> so, but, you know, for me, it's been, in that respect, it's been a blessing. I, I've never worked on music so much, so consistently in the past, ever since we've been touring as a band regularly. Yeah. Nice. Um, <clears throat> so you posted a few months ago that there may be no festival performances in the near in the near future, but we promise when this is all over, we'll provide you with our top notch performance plus more. For those who have never had the pleasure of seeing you guys live, how would you describe a typical Good Company live show? Whole lot of keyboard dancing. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, not, he's, not, he's not joking. <laughs> I'm not joking. He's right. He, you know what's funny? It was at first, and then I said no. <laughs> <laughs> and now we all collectively dance. We all collectively dance. <laughs> now we um, all go. There's, there's definitely some energy in it, um, but what you'll, what you'll get for sure is very good music and very good performances. Um, as we mentioned earlier, each individual uh, band member is a phenomenal musician in their own right. And our upbringing and our, you know, the training that we all got, I think um, when we brought it to the stage, we didn't really know what to do except what we knew how to do initially. And once we got used to each other and we started vibing off each other, we understood how to vibe off each other. And it just created this energy that from our experience, with wherever we go, people just love our performance. And we don't try to outdo each other. We don't try to, you know, sound like another group or another band. We just try to give a really, really good performance and play very good music. And I think as a result, people just really, really enjoy it. And, and if I could just add to that, like, uh... I have never in my life with any other group of friends, uh, family members, best friends, this or that, outside of these guys, I have never laughed and had a good time. Oh, yeah. Genuinely. <laughs> yeah. As, uh, I mean, yeah, we, yeah, are, we yeah. are just, it, it, and it, 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 it's never forced. And it, it doesn't matter how many days go between tours or how many time or how tired you are. There's always, you know, a look in the room, the littlest thing, and we all burst out laughing. Yeah. And yeah. that that kind of natural ability to do that with no music, uh, when we get together and do the music, I think people inadvertently feel that connection that we have, and it starts to make the, the show special, and then on top of it, the music's good, you know? And uh, I, I, I think... You know, you don't always get that. There's so many horror stories here with bands or yeah. people that are just there for the money and they hate each other or this or that. And I can say, you know, you know, there are way more laughs than cries in this band, for sure. So you yeah. really are all good company. Yeah. Yeah, the show is the show is very welcoming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if I can think of any word for it, it's very welcoming. I mean, like, You'll see bands up do like some dramatic entrances. We're just on the stage 
having some tea and some water. We you just know? like to be engaged. <laughs> we like to be engaged to, uh, with the crowd. Talking. <laughs> having, having a good time. Yeah, and, we just and, 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 and then, like, coming out and being like, all right, let's start a show. I yeah. just rock, but it's really, it's really cool. Even though Dennis works on a light cue all the time, it never goes down right. But it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. not my fault. I wrote it in there. We just do it. Right. <laughs> now we just, you know, stick around. <laughs> you know, and to piggyback on what uh, Richard said, you know, we had. I remember we did a festival uh, in Florida a couple years ago, and we hadn't seen each other in maybe like. Maybe like two weeks, we were like off for like two weeks and we went to do this one off festival. And it was like, it was trouble to get us down there to do it. Everybody was coming from different places. And we got in the van, the time it took for us to get from the airport to the venue, the driver said to us, she's never been around a band of people who laugh this much. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she was like, you guys are genuinely like, you guys genuinely like, it's a love in this situation. And I think that kind of comes across to the audience. Like people actually can feel that we actually like what we're doing, but we actually like doing it with each other. We just we like each other. I mean, we we it was a crazy day that day because we were most of us were at the airport and then we stuck. We got <laughs> yeah. uh, they canceled our flight. Yeah. And we were like, no, we gotta find a way to get down there. And then we were going through all this all this crap. And then when we finally got down there, it was we got we all got in the van and it, we literally just started laughing. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's not, it's not like, <laughs> I mean, you played three yeah. minutes and then got back on the plane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I think that's the, I think that's the general consensus that people who see us, we're like, we they get that feeling of like brotherhood, yeah, and like friendship. So it's like you can't you can't help but be moved by that, you know. Especially if everybody's talented and everybody's moving in the same direction, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can really tell the last tour we had the um, New Zealand, Australia, and Asian tour. That was like my favorite tour with everybody. I think it was just, I don't know. Like, it's probably because it was most of our first times. Yeah, it was our first times there, but I think mm -hmm. it was just because it was like you, you realize that pinnacle point, you're like, wow, we've been touring this long yeah. together. Yeah. Like, and we're still doing these amazing things together. Yeah. You know, so um And the crowd was fun. Like every time we did a show, yeah. the crowd was like, ah, like yeah. we've been doing this show for like three years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was cool, it was cool to see it. It was cool to like to watch people respond in a positive light because I think the cool thing about it is even though we've been doing this show or we've been doing that that set of songs or those that set for how many however long, people didn't feel like they were watching us kind of just go through the motions. Every time they felt like they were watching a new show. And we were trying to bring that energy, you know, like, and it just naturally happened. We walk on stage, we're back, and it's crazy because, like, when we're backstage, we have like one of the most boring backstage experiences. Like, people don't want to come. We, we're all like reading news, and like, people are drinking tea, sleeping, and, sleeping. And, sleeping. Uh, and you get on stage, quiet. and it's like it just it just turns on instantly. And it's like it just it it becomes that that thing for us, that that force for us to just be out there and want to move the crowd to be like to be you know all about what we're trying to. Mm. I would say to add further, I would say to add further to that, um, I think the difference between what we've been doing previously and what will happen once, you know, uh, uh, this post pandemic situation, you know, dissipates and people can go back to, 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 to live shows again and, and attending live shows. Um, this pan, this pandemic and this quarantine time has been a curse and it has been a blessing. And I say it in that order in the sense of, as I said before previously in a, in, in a previous question, we never really had a lot of time to kind of like sit together and really craft stuff, even if it's, for example, for, for Odyssey's records or maybe even for some of my records, some of the other individuals, you know, within the band. And I think this is probably the most time we've had to actually sit together and really kind of like, you know, soak in and, and you know, uh, um, uh, nurture the, like the next evolution of sound. For what we're going to be presenting live as um, as as a band, you know, John just mentioned um, earlier as well that you know he now has a drum set, you know, in in home. That rephrase, he's endorsed by Ludwig. Let's make it sound more. <laughs> he has a drum set. He has a drum set. <laughs> 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 
Before he was playing air drums, and now he's got a drum set. But you know, like you know, like uh, like we've like like things have actually progressed. Like now, you know, with with John being able to contribute even more in terms of like what we're doing recordings wise. You know, John has a um, a, a, a studio a studio built drum situation that is mic'd where he can actually record, you know, so many tracks, et cetera, et cetera. And all that stuff can get sent across to, 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 to Odyssey. And then if he needs more work, he'll ask me to play some guitar. Or he'll get Ralph to come up. And so we've just had time to kind of really evolve and work out the kinks in terms of, you know, where we're moving, you know, in terms of sound. And people will get a chance to hear that progression when we get back to doing live shows again. Uh, on stage, and then to 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 add to um to add to what the guys are saying about our our synergy as a band, you know we've I don't think we realize how close we are to one another. I don't think we even realize it ourselves. Like on tour, babies have been born, family members have been lost. You know we've been through tough situations, and we've we've been there to console each other as family. So the bond between us is so strong, and I think. Um, it doesn't matter how long we've been apart or whether I'm in Berlin and you know one's in Virginia and one's in DC and one's in PA. When we get together, it's as if we never left, yeah. you know? And you know, when, when people when people see that on stage, I mean, not that anybody can hear it because we're so dope, but uh, if there are ever any mistakes, nobody hears it because they see the overall performance and they see the overall energy of us as a, as a band of brothers together. So, so yeah. Nice. Um, so kind of to change the tone a little bit, my last question, <clears throat> um, how have reactions to protests and other displays of support for racial <clears throat> equality in your individual cities in recent months changed your outlook on racism in this country, if at all? It hasn't changed. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, no. this is something that we've all been witnessing for the majority of our lives. Um, some are a little bit more intense than, than others. We've all had different situations that have happened to us individually and together. I think we, we all remember being somewhere, it was probably in Germany, we were stopped at the border and you know they opened the van to talk to us and they were pointing, pointing guns right at us, semi-automatic rifles, rifles right at us. Oh, France. I think yeah, maybe it was France. Um, so just to see all of this sort of open up now as a result of, this, of what's happened. Um, the only difference, as many people have said, is the fact that it's being recorded on camera phones. And so now people are using that to their advantage or maybe to their disadvantage. Um, but all of that to say, it's funny to go back and listen to Odyssey's lyrics and to see how much of that is really uh, making oh, an impact. Yeah. If you go and listen to, you know, like really on our Colors Berlin performance or even on, on the Iceberg, you'll hear a lot of those lyrics and how much of an impact it's making right now. But, uh, you know, at the time, probably just went over people's heads. Um, so it's not really much of a surprise, you know, it's, it just seems to be a little bit more impacted now as a result of being able to see it. Yeah, yeah. I think to really, to really change anything, to really affect social change, unfortunately, in this point with the history, not only around the world, but in particular of America, you need to, and this is just my opinion here, I don't speak for everybody in the room, but you need to take, dismantle the entire system and start again. And I think right now, the way that society is run and the way that we're all especially locked in um, with so many things, that that's almost an impossibility. So, you know, saying that we're gonna, we're going to march, protest, or legislate enough so that institutionalized racism and prejudice actually goes away is like saying you'll never get sunburned from the sun. It's like until you can find a way to totally take the sun out of the equation, uh, it's always going to go down. And it's an unfortunate, but unfortunately, 
you know, growing up in this country, we've all have our stories, but I feel personally like I, I've lived with so many stories or it, in the shadows of some kind of racism so long my whole life that, I, you know, it's almost normal. And that's, and that's a sad thing. And I, I just don't see something that that's, that's embedded that normal that I can remember from when I was a little kid to being a grown man. I don't see the amount of anything that anybody can do to reverse that. It's, it's really gonna take generations upon generations of people effectively wanting that change and teaching that change down to their kids, grandkids and so on. And so far, I, you know, I haven't quite felt it, you know, so. Mm. I agree I, I would, about education. Sorry. Yeah, no, go on. Sorry, what were you saying? Sorry. No, I was just going to say, I agree. Uh, education is, I think, going to be a huge need to change that. But other yeah. 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 I, I, yeah. Just to add to what, what these guys are saying, in terms of what I've noticed has changed, is um, I'm actually able to have a conversation. I think that's been the, I think it's been the positive thing out of it is that. You know, when they talk about when they talk about like white fragility or they talk about tone policing, you know, or, um, you know, you talk about institutional racism, uh, and talking about redlining and education on the systemic, you know, systemic prejudice, you know, systemic racism in, in America and to some degree, in some, to some degree, the world over. I think what's great about that is that at least although this has been happening for so long, in conjunction again with this pandemic and the fact that nobody has anything to distract them now when the situation is brought forth into their faces the the outburst you know that this has caused has definitely been a catalyst for an exchange of information and a better understanding of what systemic racism is what was redlining about jim crow etc 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 and i think what's great is that the, the, the change starts with the conversation and the education. And it's great that um, conversation can, have, can be had between whites and blacks, um, other repre representations in, uh, in, in the minority. And I think that's the start of the change. And I think that's quite positive, you know, um, yeah, that there can be an exchange of information and, and education, even for black people. It's surprising how many black people don't know about the intricacies of the things that I just mentioned. Again, the whole sort of, you know, systemic racism, institutional racism, the Jim Crow, you know, the Jim Crow movement, you know, redlining, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's, I think that's definitely a positive as a result of what's happened. Um, well, thank you guys so much for taking the time. Is there anything I didn't touch upon that you wanna speak to or share? Do you wanna promote any social media uh, things? Uh, yeah. Uh, on Instagram, it's uh, Good Company Band, and Company does not have the letter A in it, so it's literally Good Company. Um, and Facebook, same thing, Good Company Band. Instagram, Good Company Band. Company. 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 Thank you for having us. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much.